I have access to the most successful investors in the history of the world, quite literally. I got obsessed with knowing what is the pathway, what are the asset allocations for the most successful financial investors in the world? How do I take the least amount of risk for the most amount of possible upside? If you can find eight to 12, you reduce your risk by 80% and you increase your upsides. But what about the people who don't have anything to lose? You can't diversify zero. So what do they do? When I interviewed everybody from Ray Dalio to Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, they all invest in different ways. But they had four things in common. And first of their core four that everyone agreed on was that What's up, Wealth Builders? Today, we are virtual. I haven't done a virtual podcast in a couple of years, but I had to get the opportunity to make this one happen. Um, this man needs no introduction. He has a brand new book, the third book in this trilogy of just making money and investing. And uh, this guy's a legend. He's been around so long that I just am so excited for this interview. I've got Tony Robbins. What's up, Tony? How are you, brother? Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Um, well, dude, I know our time's limited, so I want to hop right into it. Everyone knows who you are. Um, you got this book, Holy Grail of Investing, coming out. Why? Why another book? Well, it's interesting. I didn't intend to do a, a trilogy of any sort, but you know, when 2008 happened uh, and I had my billionaire clients and my barber, I mean, everybody was affected. And I know some of the people that probably watch your far broadcast are people that are entrepreneurs, and they remember those days and how difficult they were. And what made me crazy is I've been coaching Paul Tudor Jones, one of the top 10 traders in the history of the world, for 25 years. And I got to see what was going on. And, you know, the people that screwed up our economy and almost destroyed the world economy, I was waiting to see what was going to happen to them. And the way we punished them is we gave them more money. So <laughs> after about 2010, I said, you know what, this is crazy. I don't have all the answers, but I have a great gift. And that has access to the most successful investors in the history of the world, quite literally. So I decided, okay, I'm going to interview 50 of the smartest financial people alive, people that are all self-made billionaires, nobody from the Lucky Sperm Club. They all earned it, mm -hmm. and they all did it different ways, but I want to see if I can figure out what the common denominators are and how they go about it. So I wrote this book, Money Master the Game, which is like a 670-page uh, monster. Dude, that's a big uh, book. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it became number one New York Times bestseller, and it's still the best-selling financial book of this century. It's only 24 years in this century, but doing well. And then I wrote a second book, a smaller one, when we got close. I knew that obviously there was going to be a, you know, a bear market. There'd be a drop in the market. No one knows for sure when, but it's predictable. I didn't know it was going to be COVID, so I wrote that book. And I thought I was done. But when I was writing the first book, I uncovered a lot of really cool things. And let me just give you four for your investors there and your listeners. Uh, when I interviewed everybody from Ray Dalio to Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, they all invest in different ways. Some are, you know, they're trying to figure out what the... The, the largest components are in the world, or right? they're looking at the big changes on earth, right? Then there's some people there that are trying to buy at the cheapest price, you know, value investors, so many different types, but they had four things in common. And one of them sounds so simple, but it's so different than most investors. Their first of their core four that everyone agreed on was that their number one focus was not losing money, which is completely the opposite of what most investors are doing. How do I make more? How to make more? Mm -hmm. And that sounds yeah. trite and it sounds, well, yeah, that's because they have money and it's not. It's because they understand that assets can change that fast. Real estate can drop overnight. Real, you know, stock market can drop 50%. And if a stock or any asset you have drops 50%, then you got to make 100% to get even, not 50% to get even. It's hard to get 100%. It takes time. And so they know their number one focus is protection. Now, how do they do it? They use three other core principles. The first one is asset allocation. I'm sure your listeners or viewers have a good sense of what I mean by that, but it's big words. It simply means if I had a million dollars, a thousand dollars, a hundred million dollars to invest, What's most important is not which piece of real estate I'm going to buy or whether I'm going to buy Apple or Microsoft because those things are going to shift and change. What's most important is having a philosophy of investing about how much you ever put at risk versus how much you put at low risk. So think of it as like two buckets. Bucket mm -hmm. one for your investments is, am I going to put 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 80, 90? What percent is going to go in a secure bucket, meaning low risk investments, but when they're low risk, they usually have lower returns. So yeah. it's kind of like the turtle in the air. The, the turtle's going to get there. It takes longer, but you're guaranteed to get there. On the other side, you know, how much you're going to put in a risk environment where potentially there's huge upside, but you could also lose. And that balance, of course, is affected by several things. When do you need your money? If you're young, you got room to make mistakes and you could take more risk. 
You know, uh, what is your level of cash flow beyond your needs? That makes a big difference how much risk you can take. And just what's your risk tolerance in reality? So that's pretty fundamental, but it's pretty important because the very best in the world do this. And the reason I wrote the third book was several reasons, but one was I got obsessed with knowing what is the pathway? What are the asset allocations for the most successful financial investors in the world? I'm going to show you that in a second. The third distinction, it was much more interesting and fun, and that is every one of them is obsessed by asymmetrical risk reward. Big words, all it means is how do I take the least amount of risk for the most amount of possible upside? And when most people see somebody as a multi-billionaire, they think, oh man, this guy took such giant risks. And if they did and got lucky, they might have it, but if they keep doing it, they don't stay a billionaire. Right. They all are saying, how do I take the least possible? So for example, Paul Tudor Jones, it's one of the greatest investors of all time, one of the top 10. I've coached him now for, gosh, almost 30 years. A brilliant guy. And when I helped to do a turnaround him back in 1992, he's having challenges, I went in to figure out what was he doing when he's at his best. And he was always asking the question before making an investment, is this a five to one? In other words, do I risk a dollar? Do I really believe I can make five? That's the way he was trying to invest his money. Now, if you're wrong, you can risk another dollar, still make four. You can be wrong four times out of five and be okay. So that's one of the reasons he did so well. So I'll give you an example. Kyle Bass uh, took $20 million in 2008, the worst financial time ever, and turned it to $2 billion in a year. Mm. Now, it's unbelievable. How did he do yeah. it? Well, he saw the market, and everybody thought real estate's going to go up forever. It's never going to drop. And so the level of risk tolerance was just ridiculous. So he could buy synthetic devices that were so cheap that he could be wrong 13 times and make money. Well, he wasn't wrong 13 times, so he made $2 billion, right? right the market right. collapsed, he made all this money. So I was asking him one day, like, how would you explain this to like your kids or somebody less sophisticated? And he goes, so I can't believe you asked me that question. He said, because I literally was just spent the last year thinking about how I could do this for my kids. And three months ago, I figured it out. And I said, well, how'd you explain it? He goes, well, I first asked myself a question for six months. And the question was, where in the world can I find an investment where I have zero risk and the day I buy it, I'm already an upside? Mm. And my, my own head, and I'm sure yours or any intelligent investor is going, there's no such deal, right? There's no such asset. There's always risk. Said, yep. He said, everybody says that, but you know, Tony, I've read your stuff. He goes, everything is about asking better questions. So I kept asking it, and he said, I finally figured it out. Nickels. I said, nickels? He said, yeah. A nickel's worth a nickel. If I buy $10 million of the nickels, I have, I have no loss of money. But he said, here's what you understand. Nickels cost 11 cents to make. There's mm. 6.8 cents worth of just pure product in it in a five-cent item. He said, so the government used to do this with, with you know, pennies. They were made out of copper. They're not made out of copper anymore. In fact, those pennies, if you get a penny when they're still copper, are worth 300 to 400% more. He said, so guess what? I, the day I buy the nickels, I can never lose a dime. I'm up 30% just in the smelt value. And he said, and once the government gets their act together, what's they'll have to do, you can't keep making 11 cent nickels. He yeah. said, the day that happens, it'll jump to 100 or 200%. He said, if I could take everything I have and push a button and put it in nickels, I'd do it tomorrow. And he goes, so I had to prove it to my sons. He said, I called the Fed and he bought 20 million nickels <laughs> and he had truckloads of it and they mm -hmm. loaded it up so they could make it happen. I'll give you one more quick example. You know, uh, Richard Branson's a friend. And if you know Richard, he is a total risk taker, right? He'll risk his life on a balloon across the, the ocean. He'll jump in a, in a space, uh, you know, spaceship he's built and go into space. He takes life risks. But when he goes to investing, he's not into risk. His whole thing is, what's the downside? Let's cover the downside. The upside will take care of itself. So a perfect example of this, you're sharing with me that when he went to go compete, you know, with British Airways, which, you know, gigantic organization. And what's his risk? Well, he's going to buy 100 of these Boeing airplanes. I don't know if it was 100. It was a large number. And he said, and his mind's like, man, if this doesn't work, my entire career is over. So he negotiated for about a year and a half until he got Boeing to agree that if he bought that many planes, if after a year and a half he was not profitable, he could return the planes with no expense to himself and no hit to his credit whatsoever. Mm. Well, now, look, you got no downside. Think about yep. the lack of stress, only yep. upside. So the best are always looking for that. And they can't find it every moment, but you're there. And then the fourth one is one we all know, diversification. But it's not just diversification you know, within, you know, a, a particular asset or asset class.
but diversification across different countries, different denominations, and different time frames. So to give an example, he, Ray Dalio taught me, he said, Tony, if you grew up investing in real estate, say your parents are poor and they took crappy places, fixed them, rolled them, and you made money your whole life that way. Your parents did, you did too. You're a real estate investor. If your parents gave you, uh, you know, IBM stock when you're 12 or your grandmother did and it grew, you probably love stocks. But I don't care what you love. The biggest mistake on earth, and he says, I've seen this because I've been in the investing field for 45 years, is whatever you love most, whatever has been totally successful to you, there will be a day when it reverses overnight and you lose 50 to 70%. And he mm. walked me through every asset class and showed me it's true. Mm. He said, so you have to diversify. So, so let me ask you a question with this, you know, yes. in, in terms of diversification and everything else, right? We're talking to billionaires who are obviously in a different position than most people, right? Yes. Um, to me, diversification is not smart when you're starting out. I believe in specialization and taking high risk, especially if you're young and trying to make some money. And so for you, you know, and we're, and we're just talking about kind of like trying to take asymmetric risk. And that makes yep. sense when you have something to lose. But what about the people who don't have anything to lose, who don't oh. have skill? You can't diversify zero. So what do they do? <laughs> Well, you, your bottom line is you got to start with where you are. But yes, you still want to diversify what will bite you. But you were right. As I said earlier, if you're really young, you got room to make up for your mistakes. So right. you can do that. But you, it would be the dumbest mistake in your lifetime to think that specialization by itself is going to be it because you've been rewarded for it. You're 30. How old are you right now? 34. You are screwed if yeah. you live that for the rest of your life because yeah. you've lived only so much. So it's like, I remember when interest rates were 18% to give an example, mm -hmm. and I hear people complaining about seven and I just laugh, right? Yeah. My first home I bought for 18. People say, oh, that'll never happen. No, it, it's on its way to happening again. I'm not saying 18%, but right. we're seeing those same changes. So I really caution you because ego gets really big when you're successful. I had mm -hmm. the same thing happen to me in my 30s. I remember going to Paul Tudor Jones and going, I'm getting... 80% compounded per month I was doing yeah. trading, right? And he smiled and laughed and said, that's really great. You just keep doing that. And he says, but do you really think you're smarter than me in the long term? You're going to yeah. do better than well, I'm doing? And, and, and my point with it was not that I don't diversify. I'm saying for the, the beginning listener who's trying to get started, it's like, you know, they're not a millionaire yet, right? They don't have a ton yeah. of stuff to lose, right? Well, let, let me give you some ways yeah. so you can see the ways, because that's what's really exciting. So let me give you one more distinction. Everyone knows that my favorite way to build wealth is through real estate investing. That's the reason that I started Wealthy Investor, where we've trained thousands of students. But here's the thing. I've noticed that so many people fail to get started in real estate because they're worried about the money. They don't know where they're going to get the money to buy a house or flip or handle their renovations and things like that. And so... They just never get started. I want to change that. And that's why I created a brand new free course that goes over five different ways that you could buy houses without using any of your own money today. And I'm going to give you it completely for free. All you have to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com slash podcast. I've made it specifically for you. The moment you go to that link, you'll be able to go get access to it and learn how you could start buying houses today without any of your own money. And if you're somebody who already has a real estate business and who wants to scale, we want to help you too. You can click the link below and book a free strategy call with our team if that's you. After all this, I wrote the book and then Ray Daly and I became good friends. And one of the days I was digging through with him, and I was going deeper and I was like, you know, out of all the things that you've taught me, all the things that you know, if there was one single principle of investing that would guarantee long-term success more than any other. I mean, this is a guy that manages $195 billion. He manages money for China, for sovereign funds. I mean, he's the best in the world. In 2008, the market drops almost 50%. He was up 8%. He warned everybody about it. That's how sharp this guy is. He said, Tony, I obsessed all this over about a decade and a half. And he said, I have figured out an economic formula that I use every day and I'll share with him. He goes, I call it the holy grail of investing. That's where the title of the book comes from. Mm. And that's why I wrote this book. I said, well, what is it? He said, think about it, Tony. You know, one of the things I know you're obsessed by is helping people just beginning the journey or people that are starting late to still succeed. Well, to get to their financial goals, they either got to put a lot more money in or they've got to get bigger returns. Well, going for bigger returns requires bigger risk and bigger risk eventually leads to losing what you're after and then you lose the years. Mm -hmm. He said, so it's a conundrum, right? That's why asset allocation is so important. He said, so I figured something out. He said, if you can find eight to 12 
uncorrelated investments that you really believe in, you reduce your risk by 80% and you increase your upside. Mm. I'm like, you've got to show me this. So we spent an hour walking through the math of it, showing me how it works, but it's a fact. Now I, I left there writing this down. It's like, okay, I got to organize things that way. It's not easy to do. And then about three months after this, I was at JP Morgan's alternative investment conference. I was a speaker and you got to be a billionaire to go to the program. And the, the person right before me is Ray Dalio. And somebody asked him a very similar question, and he gave his holy grail of investing. And I watched all these billionaire guys that hadn't taken a note the entire day, you know, through all the speakers, duck their heads, and they uh -huh. started writing it down. Because right. it's so simple. If you can reduce your risk 80%, you got, you'd be an idiot not to figure it out. So I went to go work at it. Now, how do you do that? Well, guess what? Most people understand correlation. You know, if the market's going great, you certainly want to have a lot of money in stocks. They're going to have the greatest upside. If it's not great, people are counting on bonds because they're not correlated usually to protect them. But unfortunately, in 2022 or 2008, whenever there's these big crashes, they usually both crash. And if you go to your broker, they go, I don't know what happened. You know, this never happens. It happens every time. We can go through that another time. It's too detailed. Didn't Silicon Valley Bank implode because they had all these bonds that were just... They were bad bonds now. Well, they were bad. It was just the fact that they bought them the long-term yeah. bonds at low rates, and then interest rates went the, grew the fastest they have in history. So, yeah, right. they were upside down. So here's what you have to understand, though. Most people are putting their money into, let's say, stocks, bonds, let's say, real estate investment trusts, or maybe small, their own private real estate or something of that nature. But in order for you to really be able to find 8 to 12 uncorrelated investments in the world we're in today – you really have to look at private assets, private mm. equity, private credit, and obviously private real estate. And I know mm. that's something, private real estate, something you focus on. So yeah. think about this for a second. When I started looking around, I was like, okay, how am I going to do this? And I, I discovered a statistic that blew my mind. If you want to do well, understand this stat. For the last 35 straight years, private equity has outstripped every stock market in the world. When I say private equity, for, for this book, I wrote, I interviewed 13 of the biggest private equity guys in the world. None of them less than 20% compounded a year for decades. One of them is 36% compounded for 26 straight years. I mean, it's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. But just average private equity has outstripped them. So I'll give you an example. If you invested in the S&P 500 index, right? Top 500 companies here in this country. And you put money in 35 years ago. Here's how it works. 9.2 compounded returns. That's pretty nice. You know, if you're at 5%, it's going to take you 14 and a half years to double your money. You know, at 9%, it's going to take eight years. But basic, not the best people, basic private equity to 14.2%. And what does that mean? It means that you're compounding 50% more every year compounded through time. So if you put a million dollars in the S&P 500 35 years ago and that didn't do anything, it's worth $26 million right now. But if you put the same money in private equity for the same period of time, it's worth $139 million. Wow. If you go to the Fortune 400 and say, who are the wealthiest men or women in the world? And I asked you, what industry are they in? What would you say it is? A lot of people would think real estate, but it's yeah. not. It's yeah, not. It's not. Yeah. 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 I would a say the business people, owners. A lot of other people say tech. It's not. Right. It's financial services, but it's not hedge funds. Because mm. hedge funds go up and down. But private equity, you, you give up something for that greater return, you give up time. So your money is tied up. It's not liquid for five years, right? Same reason people usually do well in real estate is they can't push a button and get rid of it really quick, right? So it's mm -hmm. the advantage. But their advantage is when the market drops, they buy. <laughs> you know, they don't, yeah. they don't, they're not forced to sell like a hedge fund or somebody else. And when it goes up high, they sell. So I started looking at this and going, this is insane. So what is the... You know, the wealthiest people in the world, what, are their, what does their asset allocation look like? And you discover that they have over 46% of their money in private assets. Wow. And only 29% in the public. And there's a reason. We used to have 8,000 stocks. There's only 3,700 now to invest in. Hmm. And what's interesting is you look at the Fortune 500, or I should say the S&P 500, you know, there's seven companies that are producing 28% of the entire what the other 493 the are stocks, doing. Right? It's yeah. so out of balance right now. Yeah. So if right now, if you look at companies that do 100 million or more, 87% of them are private. So these private equity people come in, and this is what I love. They don't just try to buy something right. The old days, 20 years ago, they buy something, cut it up, sell off the pieces. Today, the idea is it's so competitive. You've got to add massive value. So these guys that I interviewed, for example, uh, Robert Smith's one of them. He has a company called Vista. 
And Vista has produced these returns that are through the roof, but he's built it from nothing to $100 billion. Mm. And so when I started looking at this, I was like, wow, this, this is exciting, but you know, how do I really help people? I said, I could write a book on it, but not everybody can participate. That's what and I was going to ask. How do you even find private equity and get access? Because it's, it's kind of like the, the rich man's game. You're right. That's what it has been. So two really cool things. Number one, even if you could find it, you couldn't get into most of it before yep. because it's like if you want to buy an SP3 Ferrari right now, they're four million bucks, but you can't buy one because they're already pre-sold all the guys that already own Ferraris. That's what it's like when you have the very best guys in private equity, right? It's sold already to the ultra wealthy. It's sold to sovereign funds. It's sold to pension funds and so forth. And so it's kind of like you know, if you go to a club in New York and you know you got a lot of money, you're, you're going to be on the other side of the red note. And it, money won't do it. It's like you got to know the people. You got to be attractive enough to get in. Yeah, yeah. So I found myself going, okay, I got to find these eight to twelve, this magic formula. But the best people I wanted to get into was incredibly hard, and I, and I got a good name and I got good capital. Yeah, it's even hard for you as a guy with status and relationships yes. and money. Yeah. Because guys, wow. with a hundred, you got a billion dollars, you're nobody. You got a hundred billion dollars, we got, we got interest. We'll talk to you. Yeah, it's a different thing. But here's what was so cool. So I get little slices because of my reputation or relationships, but it wasn't enough to, you know, to really transform my economics. And then one day I was sitting with a friend of mine who's worked with Paul Tudor Jones, and he split off and formed his own company. And I was lamenting, going, you know, I, I got this formula. I got the, I know the best people in the world. I got little slices, but man, this is so hard to get into these firms. And by the way, when you get into them, they call you a limited partner. When you're an investor, as you probably know, yeah, yeah. general partner owns the thing, right? Mm -hmm. And he says to me, Tony, um, he said, you've done so much for me. I, I got to let you in a little secret. I said, what? He goes, I want to tell you where I put most of my money in the world. Now this guy's incredibly wealthy and started with nothing. So I'm leaning forward in my chair, right? What do you think where, he was going to say? Where, where do you put it, right? Yeah. He goes, there's this firm in Houston called Cas. I said, Houston? Houston, Texas? Because usually you talk to somebody who's wealthy, it's like London, Singapore, you know, New York, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. He goes, yeah, they're off the beaten path, but here's what they've done. He goes, you don't have to compete to get some little slice of just one of those funds. What if I told you that you don't have to be a limited partner, that there's a way for you to be a general partner where you are side by side with the owners on all their funds and you're getting the two and 20. So for your audience, in case they don't know it, these people are so successful, they can charge you 2% a year, mm -hmm. hide their money for five years and you're willing to do it because the gigantic returns you make, but that guarantees them if they have a billion dollar fund, which is tiny fund, if they're just getting their 2%, they got, guess what? $100 million guaranteed for five years. Not a bad base. Then they get 20% of the upside. It's not uncommon to take that billion dollar fund and turn it into $2 billion in five years or less. They get 20% of that second billion. So they make $300 million and a billion dollars. Now you know why the richest people in the world are in this industry. And I'm like, I could be one of those. I could have a slice of one of those and I could buy maybe multiple groups. So I got massive, they have diversification within themselves. But some are in the industry, like let's say SaaS is their expertise, right? These I can buy across different industries. Many of them have literally thousands of different or hundreds of different companies. And I can make the two and 20 and have cash flow while they also have massive growth in my business. Mm. He said yes. So I became a client of this company this years ago. And then I invested and became a part of it. And then I, the co-author of my book is the guy that is the part of this firm, Christopher Zook's his name. I said, Christopher, we got to get out because here's the second thing that happened. I was telling all my wealthy friends about this, but I'd be frustrated for other people. I was like trying to cut them in on monies I had and helping them. But Congress, just the House, just passed the law, bipartisan, that changes the game. And here's what's different. Up until now, the government has controlled and made sure only the wealthiest people in the world have opportunities like this because they have, as you know, different terms for where you are economically and it determines whether you have access. So one is called an accredited investor, which means you have to have a million dollar net worth, not counting your real, your home yep. and or you have to make $200,000 a year. Well, that's a big jump for most people. And yep. what's crazy, I've always said, this is stupid because a lot of people inherit money. They're not sophisticated investors. Or maybe mm -hmm. they're good in business and they made money in a business and sold it, but they don't know anything about investing. 
So they just changed the rules so that now you'll be able to take a test. Now, the Senate has to pass it. It's in the Senate right now, but they think they'll pass it over the next three months. This was bipartisan on both sides. You take a little test, and then you're a qualified investor. You don't need a million dollars. You don't need 200000 And now you have access to some of the greatest investments in history. So that's the other reason why I wrote this book. Mm, no, I love that. As somebody who's raised, who's done funds myself for real estate, um, I, I've always wondered that, right? Because we've all, we're only able to raise publicly to this point with accredited investors, and we've done well with that. And then, you know, you can do a friends and family fund and be able to cut those guys in. But, you know, unless you go through doing a reg A and just all these hurdles to be able to allow the general public to get in on something like this, it's super difficult. So I'm actually excited to hear you say that there's this this new thing coming that's going to allow everyone to get in because that's it's not correct. really fair. Like there's so much information out there, right? Like they're going to read your book and then all of a sudden say, well, dude, I want to invest in this, but I'm not accredited. So this isn't yeah. fair. Like, yeah, you know, how do the I get whole, in? That's why I wrote the book because the whole thing's changed now. But let me tell you, it's not just, first of all, the GP, it's called GP stakes, owning general partnership stakes and multiple firms is the greatest investment of my lifetime. I've got unbelievable real estate investments. I've done well in so many different markets. But just imagine having the best investors on the face of the earth who are working around the clock and you're their partner and you get their cash flow, <laughs> yeah. you know, eight to 10% cash flow while I'm getting these returns that are astronomical and they're the ones working around the clock to do it. It's unbelievable leverage. Unbelie it's, uh, I'll give you an example. I'll give you one more. So another one is private credit. Okay, mm. interest rates have gone crazy, as we all know. Yeah. Affects the real estate market, as you well know. But let's take a look at what's happening here on the other side. Since 2008, the banks started tightening up. After Silicon Valley, you know, Silicon Bank and all the other regional banks are having troubles, they've tightened even more recently. Well, over this time period, you know, most of the companies that are 100 million to 3 billion, that's the largest number of companies in the United States, there's 200,000 of them. And they don't get money from the banks like Apple can easily do or Microsoft. They don't even need it at Apple anymore. Mm -hmm. well, so how do they get their money? Well, the private equity groups became the new banking industry. Yep. And they are much, much better at valuing a company than banks are and also valuing the management team, their effectiveness. And so they've become the lending vehicle basically for most medium-sized businesses, 100 million to 3 billion or more. And some of them obviously much bigger. But what's interesting is, you know, if you bought a mortgage or got a mortgage and it was at 3%, and these last couple of years, you know, now it's 7%, 7 you're a happy camper, right? Yeah. You've locked in and you have no fear. But if you had a floating rate, right, which is what business loans are, yeah. but if you had a floating rate in your real estate, now it would cost you two and a half times more for your mortgage each month. Well, guess what? On private credit companies, which I get to own the two and 20 on as well, and you get as well, the best in the world know how to value things so well. They have a 1% failure rate. No bank on earth has that. It's the most incredible environment. And guess what? When interest rates went up, a lot of these loans were, business loans were 5 and 6% when houses were 3%, right? Well, guess what? Now they're paying 12 and 13. I, we have the same loans. We have no more risk. And our profitability went through the roof. Or think about it. You know, when bonds are giving you nothing, say 2021, where did people go who wanted bonds? So many people went for junk bonds because you're getting nothing on them, and they were providing 3.9%. Yeah. And, you're, you're, and, and they call them high-yield bonds. They're junk bonds. They're terrible companies. And, of course, that whole thing crashed in 2021 after running up the mountain. I was getting 9% on private credit with a 1% risk rate. Well, these mm. people are taking giant risk to do 3.9%, and yep. they're getting a 2 and 20. Right. So it's like opportunity. When you enter this universe... It's a, I just had this, these conversations in the last year since I started doing this with all of my kids. I mean, I've done well, and I've told them all, I'm not going to make you a trust fund kid. You're going to have to do well yourself. And now they're all in it because they have the ability to make it happen before it wouldn't happen. I'll give you another fun one for you that I think your audience will love, Ryan. When I was growing up, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. I had four different fathers. One was a semi-pro baseball player. Hmm. But, you know, I got started late, and I did. By the time I was in high school, it became obvious I'm not going to be a pro. Right? <laughs> so I had to kind of shift and see what I was going to do. But I used to go to Dodger Stadium in L.A. here, and I'd buy the cheapest ticket up in the right field bleachers of all I can afford and bleed Dodger blue for the team. Now, I own a piece of the team, right? It's pretty, pretty amazing. Oh, but, I didn't know you owned part of the Dodgers. That's oh, crazy. Oh, yeah, and the Warriors and a bunch of others. But I'll tell you what, wow. how it started – I started, but took forever to make enough money to be able to own a sports team, mm -hmm. to be a partner in it. 
Yeah. Then they put a microscope to you. You can't believe what they put you through to become an owner. And three years ago, though, so the first team I did was the LAFC Football Club. I partnered with Peter Goober and a group of brilliant people. I got to be part of that and help develop the team, build the stadium. It was fun. Then I moved to Florida, so I was never at the games. So it was kind of crazy. But yep. interestingly enough, three years ago, the rules changed. And Major League Baseball, the NBA, National Hockey Association, and soccer, all three changed the rules so that it was possible under very spe specific regulations to have you buy pieces of more than one team through an institution. And, but it's really hard to do because only institutions that can do it can use no leverage. They have a lot of criteria. But why yeah. would you want to own part of a sports team besides the fun of it? Well, it's an uncorrelated advancement. It doesn't matter what real estate does. doesn't matter what, in, what happens with interest rates. doesn't matter what's in the stock market. Totally separate. Second part that's beautiful about it is it's a monopoly. It's a legal monopoly. Yeah. yeah. Because in your city, they can't, no one can compete with you. Third, yeah. your customers are fanatics. That's where the word fan comes from. Multi-generational right. usually that are there. Yeah. Fourth, when inflation happens, doesn't affect these sports at all. These sports mm -hmm. continue to go up. They charge more for a hot dog and people pay more for, while they're out there for the hot dog. No problem. But the yeah. biggest difference in sports today is they are the solution to cord cutting for all advertisers. Mm. Uh, if you look at the top 100 shows last year, most watched shows, 92 were sporting events. Wow. And the reason is because you can't stream them. you got to watch them in real time, and people then end up watching the ads. I mean, the Super Bowl is the most exaggerated example of that, obviously. But right. this is huge. So the media rights is much more than the butts and seats, and now they're real estate groups. They buy all the real estate around it. I'm sure you've seen some of the new stadiums, all yep. the ancillary elements. These are mega organizations now that are brilliant. So getting a piece of them is a whole different game. So I own now a piece of, you know, I've coached some of these teams. I have rings for championships from the Warriors, the Dodgers, et cetera. But I have a piece of the Dodgers, the Warriors, uh, the Reds, Boston Red Sox, Dodgers and mm. the Red Sox. I said, wow. I do that through this fund, this group, right? Um, I've got the P Pittsburgh Penguins. I've got, uh, you know, Liverpool overseed in, in soccer. Mm. So this tra I've got the F1, you know, Aston Martin of a piece of. Wow. So it's like, it's so much fun because you have these sports teams that you have a portion of the young, but also it's non-correlated. And I'll give you an example. Well, I'll add to this too. I, I don't know if you know this. I got drafted by the Oakland A's. So yes, I'm, I, saw, I saw that. Yeah. So the sports one, I've noticed guys starting to buy teams. You know, I saw Patrick Bed David got part of the, the Yankees. And I was like, man, how are these guys buying? Like it, it, it was this, once again, this roped thing. Right. And people started paying crazy prices for them. It's like the Broncos just sold for billions and they ain't it's even that good. Yeah. And I'm like, man, this is crazy that this is happening but then like you said it's a monopoly i've never heard of a sports a, a major league franchise going bankrupt um they, they have all these real estate plays yep. you know i'm in here in vegas now and the a's are coming which That's right. i got drafted by i'm like dude i gotta own the a's one day at least a piece because it's yeah. just like full circle but you know they're gonna do a whole real estate play on the strip That's right. you know, with all this stuff and i'm like that investment can't lose there's no way Oh, and you think about it, you know, think about how long the Yankees have been around, almost 100 years. There aren't many companies that last no. about it. I can't tell you which network will be around 50 years from now, but I can tell you there'll still be a World Series, right? But it's just, yep. if, you, if you look at humanity all the way back to, you know, the, the Romans and going in those gladiators, we have this desire for sport. It's a way for us to deal emotionally. And people will invest in 2020. A lot of people are worried about what's going to happen to those assets. A lot of them are shut down for a period of time. Assets continue to grow. I'll give you an example. The LA Dodgers. So Peter Goober's my dear friend and partner. He's one of the guys who engineered that deal. Uh, Magic Johnson was part of a whole group of brilliant investors. And they paid $2 billion for the Dodgers. Now, that was way before the Broncos and all this type of thing, yeah, right? They bought them from the McCourts, no one, I think. No one had been, and no one had paid $800 million, more than $800 million for a sports team. And they all agreed, a baseball team, they all agreed, okay, it's probably worth a billion. Maybe a billion one, but two billion, you're never going to make any money. So I went to Peter, of course, my friend, and I said, Peter, I know you're no dummy. <laughs> you're going to invest two billion. How are you going to make money at this? And everybody says you're going to lose. And it was every sports commentator, every news person there. They guys are crazy. He goes, Tony, you know me well enough. But he goes, I, you know, I make, he has 52 Academy Award nominations. He ran Sony, Columbia, TriStar. He's a brilliant movie maker. He says, I'm going to leave you on a little cliffhanger. It's my favorite thing. He goes, Tuesday, I'll make the announcement. As soon as you're here, call me. Come over. We'll have a little party together. 
So sure enough, they announced on Tuesday, when you own a sports team, NBA and Major League Baseball, the media is a huge part of the income, right? Mm-hmm. You get an equal share of everybody across the country. If you're the worst team or the best team, doesn't matter. You get equal share of the national media, but you own your local media. Yep. He sold the local media in one day for $7 billion and made $5 billion that day. He got the team for right? free and made so $5 it's like It's my money. <laughs> but, but Michael Jordan's a great example. Michael Jordan bought Charlotte, the NBA team, now the Hornets. He got the name back for $275 million 11 and a half years ago. Yeah. He just sold it to a group of partners. I'm one of them for $3 billion, and we're mm. thrilled with it. Mark so, Cuban just did it too. Pardon me? Mark Cuban just sold uh, the Mavs. Yes, he sold a big part to the Dallas Mavs. He's kept the piece, and so did Michael. Michael still kept the piece. But that's a pretty nice return on your investment for 11 years. Yeah. If you look at just the last 10 years and you took the average return across Major League Baseball, soccer, hockey, and the NBA, it's 18% compounded for the last 10 years. It's 11% for some of the best years of the S&P 500, to give you well, an idea. Well, and you're not even counting like the – I don't even know how to say it, but like the clout factor of everything else that comes from owning the team, right? That's different than investing in a stock and what, right. like, dude, you own a, you own a real team, yeah. it, regardless of what the team actually makes you, there's, there's all this other value that's happening. And there's fun and there's an enjoyment and a fun that comes from it versus some money that's sitting, you know, on a piece of real estate you don't do anything with. I'm not saying you should do that as well. Of course you should. And of course you should own some S&P because you want liquidity, right? It's, of course you have some bonds, a small amount, depending upon what your needs are and so forth but these are the investments that nobody knows about yep. that only the wealthy have had access to and on some of these only recently are even available to them but now those small slices are available and it's just a blast so it's like i don't have to say i got one team you know I have all these how, teams how do you how team. do you get them i i, I want to know how do you do it well uh, I, I i can't announce it because you have to get a prospectus and so forth okay but if people go to the book it tells you where to go and i just have to go through the proper legal channels as you know to okay. make that happen but it's really simple you can you'll in the book you'll know there's a website and go to you get the information and you can decide uh, what you want to do or not do in those areas but and i'm just, gonna link to the link i'm gonna link to the book down below but don't you also have um a summit coming up too talking yes. about some of these things yes real quick well i'm, I'm every year since covid began I've had, um, I've done a free event. You know, what happened is I was, you know, I do stadiums normally, 15, 20,000 people. And March of 2020, when COVID happened, I get this phone call from the governor's office in California saying, oh, by the way, we have a new rule. You can put 100 people in the stadium. And yeah. I'm like, well, wait, wait a second. That's not, that's that ain't not gonna work for my problem. business. <laughs> yes. So, so, I, so I, I immediately said, you know what? Screw it. We'll move to Vegas. They'll never shut down Vegas, right? Mm. So we moved 13,000 people to go to Vegas, and 10 days out, they shut down Vegas. Then they did the same thing, and we moved to Texas. The governor's never going to shut it down. Shut down a Texas. So then we went to movie theaters. Okay, we'll do 13,000 movie theaters, 10 people in each one. That's the limit. Big screens, music. They'll still have some people there you know, to interact with. They shut down the movie theater. So I built wow. this studio, 25,000 square feet. You know, uh, 20 foot high LED screens, 0.67, so I can see everything going on to the person. And we started doing these events. And the, I decided, when everybody's stuck at home and we feel so depressed, I said, I'm going to do an event for multiple days for total free. So there's no money, no travel. They can do it from their home or their office. They can do it with their family. And I'm going to see what I can do to help people. And the first one I did, half a million people attended. The one we did last year, we had a million and a half people for it. And so we're doing one more this year. I do it only once a year. It's coming up January 25th through the 27th next week. Nice. And it's at 2 p.m. Eastern, and there's zero charge. And what I do is I take people through how to lay it out so you really have a strategy to transform your business and your life, whether it be your body, your emotions, your relationships, your finances, your career. We cut each of those topics. It's only two and a half hours, three hours a day, roughly, for three days in a row. But you will get a momentum out of it that's unbelievable. And then you're part of a community over over a million plus people around the world who are all working to make these changes who support each other. So it's one of my favorite things I do now. And again, there's no cost. So if people want to go to it, you go to time to rise.com. So time to rise summit. Excuse me, time to rise summit.com. Okay. And, we'll uh, link to that down you know, below for everyone. Click on that, you go there again, there's no charge, and you can come join us next week and we can go for an experience. I promise you'll never forget. No, I love it. I love it. And I've seen um, your guys' free events and paid events and everything. It's always worth it. I got a personal question for you, though, you know, related to events and, and doing education so long. And, you know, like, I think I don't even know how many years you've been doing it now, like 40 years, longer than I've been alive, right? 46. 46 years. And 
you know, I just started doing events and education and I see how much work goes into throwing an event and building a brand and creating new content. Like, you know, you're, you're constantly creating new content and helping people. How do you have such longevity when all these other people just kind of like come and go? You've seen all these guys come and go over the years. Yeah, Why sure. are you different? Well, I think results is what matters, right? In the end, you can, what you say with your lips doesn't matter. You know, the way your feet move, your body moves, the results you get for people are everything. So I built my brand by doing results because I was just a kid, right? I was 23, 24 years old and I got on a radio show and launched my career. And the way I launched it is I basically said, listen, I don't care what your problem is. I don't care if you've had therapy for years. I don't care if you have uncontrollable phobias. See me in one hour, guaranteed. You don't pay me a dime if I don't produce the result. I'm the one-stop therapist. I did my first radio show mm. like this in Vancouver. And one of the guys that calls in is a psychiatrist. He built my entire career. He built the model for it. And he said, you know, you're a liar. You're a charlatan. People <laughs> like you should not be allowed on the radio. You can't wipe out a phobia in an hour. It can take years. And so the guys are attacking the hell out of me. And, you know, I'm like you, you know, I've, I've got a sporting background as well. If you're competitive, you're athletic, you don't take shit, but you're also, you can be <laughs> kind. So I try to be kind. I said, well, sir, let me ask you a question. I said, you know, are you a scientist? He said, of course, I'm a physician. Mm -hmm. I said, great. Well, as a scientist, I know you'd never make an assumption. So you must be stating your hypothesis. Your hypothesis is I'm a liar and a charlatan and this is impossible. But I said, you never met me, have you? You said, no, never met my patients, no. Well, then I suggest that uh, you come test your hypothesis. I'm going to be at the Holiday Inn tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. It's free, right? I'm going to do some demonstrations. And I said, you should bring me one of your patients. Bring me somebody you've never been able to cure. I said, I'm sure you got plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> a little slight. So just give him a little yep, hint, right? Yep. He goes, I like well, that. we all have patients that aren't ready to change yet. And I said, well, that's funny. I haven't found any. Of course, I've only done like four therapies at that point. <laughs> I'm 100%. <laughs> I don't lose. <laughs> but the yep. long story short is I finally got him to come. He brought me this woman he worked on for seven years. I wiped out her snake phobia in about 20 minutes. I wrapped the snake around her. And that's what launched my career. Then I started working with sports teams, turning them around. Then I got to work with Nelson Mandela and President Clinton, Mother Teresa. So when you get results in all these areas over and over again, people don't have to believe in you. They don't have to hear your marketing. They hear from everybody else who's been through the experience. So I think there's no replacement for over-delivering. You know, mm. as much as I can promise, I always over deliver. And I think that's the secret. And Ryan, I know you've done really well in this area, so I haven't seen what you do, but you must be over delivering or you wouldn't build your brand. But the secret is constantly compete with yourself, not other people. It's like Michael Jordan, when I interviewed him years ago, you know, I was talking to him about, you know, how, what makes him the best in the world? You know, why is it? Is it skills and abilities, God given talent? And he was really awesome. He said, Tony, I can be straight with you. He said, I clearly have some God given talent. But he said, when I was in high school, I got cut from the team my junior year because my coach said, you know, you, I said, I'm the best. You can't cut me. And he said, no, you're not the best. You're the most talented. Mm. But you don't use most of your talent. You don't have enough push. You don't have enough strength. You don't have enough conviction. You don't have enough discipline. And so he literally told him the only way he'd be a player in the senior year is if he came in every morning at 7 a.m. and before school and practiced for 45 minutes with him. And he said, I'll make you the best you can be. And he did it. He did the same thing in his future life. So it's like, he said, Tony, every day, my goal is to do more, to compete, not with other people, but compete with myself. Every day, I want to do more than I've ever done before with me. And that's what makes you successful. You don't look at other people's competition. You say, my competition is producing more value for people than anybody else on earth. And if you do that over and over again for years and decades, you'll be there when everybody has a little pop up and disappears shortly thereafter. And I've had that privilege over it's actually going to be my 47th year now, just starting. Would you say that that's the so the ultimate sign of doing things right is longevity versus, you know, just like maybe you're, you're hot for really hot for a minute. And then, you know, because you just see that. Well, you can market your way to being hot. Yeah. You can't market your way to being a, a, you know, a lifelong brand that generations still come to. That's only by getting results. Yeah. So what, what keeps you fueled and motivated to keep competing against yourself? You know, is it, is it getting into new things and learning, you know, this alternative investments? I mean, obviously you're super passionate. It's, it's yes. new. You weren't yes. doing that 10 years ago, 20 That's years right. ago. Right. So is right. it just that, that newness or what? 
It's I, I I live to see people lit up, and my view is I don't want to light them up just with enthusiasm. I want to give them tools and strategies and insights that truly are life changing. So my previous book right before this was actually Life Force. I interviewed 150, and this is the formula I use. I go and model the best on earth, and I bring what I learned from them. And on the emotional psychological side, you know, obviously I'm recognized as the best in that area. So I combine. For example, the financial side, everything in these books is not my ideas, it's the best of the people on earth. I mean, this book also has 13 of the biggest, greatest investors in private equity history. And the interviews with them, you'll learn as much about how to run a business or invest than you will from anywhere, because these are the smartest guys on earth. But I did that with health. I, you know, I, I tore my rotator cuffs, supposed to have surgery. I was looking into stem cells. People told me, oh, it's a waste of time. You know, we have a lot of sports teams and I got some of the best surgeons. They all want to do surgery. I was like, wait a second. Let me talk to the number one stem cell guy in the world, go to the best, see what he says. And he said, Tony, come down. You can't do it in the U.S. Come down here to Panama. He said, you have no downside. You always back and do the surgery, but you'll be blown away. Three days and my shoulder was perfect. I, I've never mm. had surgery. I have friends that I try to convince at that time. Now they don't do it anymore. But they went and got the surgery and they've had to have two or three of them. And mine is totally healed. So I literally wrote this entire book. Now, how much passion I have when I start discovering things that can heal the body, regenerate you, reduce the number of years. If you're 40, bring you back to 30 physiologically in your body. Those things excite me. So it's having something great to give people that inspires me and then just seeing the results in people's lives. It's an addiction. I can't go anywhere in the world without being stopped a half dozen, dozen times a day with someone saying, you changed my life. And I would say, I didn't change your life. I'm glad I helped. You did the work, but what did it? And they'll tell me, what, you know, I tripled my business. I went to your business master. I did this thing with my investments or I did this thing with my health. And I love the diversity of the subjects I get to jump into as well. Yeah, no, and I'm just looking at you right now on camera, I was thinking, I was like, dude, he actually kind of looks younger than <laughs> like watching things from five years ago, even. Yeah. So yeah. I obviously, feel it. yeah, no, it, it looks it. And I mean, whether it's health or finance or relationships, it's just constantly improving. So, dude, I know your, your, your time is super valuable. You got the book coming out. We got the summit. We'll link to all those down below. I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It means a lot. Keep inspiring people. And I'm, I'm, I'm most impressed, like I said, as a young guy, seeing how much longevity you've had in this space yeah. and, and not just being content reaching a certain level, but still going after it. So that inspires me to do that. Well, thank you, Ryan. But, you know, I think you've got the makings of it. I don't blow smoke and I don't bullshit people. Just what I've heard about you and everything else. If you want to know what I believe really it takes, I think to be incredibly successful, it takes, I love wickedly smart people, right? Intelligence is incredible, but there are some people that are very smart. They can't fight their way out of a paper bag pragmatically. I found <laughs> the most important gift you could have is hunger. And mm. I still feel it in you. You had it because you're an athlete and because you were successful in that area. And so then you've had to enter into a new career at a young age. And I can feel your hunger. If you keep that hunger alive, that's what will make you keep growing. And if you keep growing, you're going to have more to give. You get more to give. Your brand will only get bigger. And more importantly, you'll enjoy your life more. So I'm looking forward to having a ticket to your journey because... You know, it'll be 30. You got 30 more plus years almost to be in the position I'm in right now. Yeah. I don't mean where I am economically. I'm sure you can yeah, do that yeah. even sooner. But I mean just the position of having, you know, that many years under your belt of helping people. And I look forward to seeing this, how your story grows. I love it. I appreciate the kind words and the advice. And guys, go get the book, Holy Grail of Investing. Attend the summit. We are going to link to it down below. And uh, Tony, we'll have to have you back on another time. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, Ryan. Blessings to All you. Right. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Peace. I don't love all the work. I love meeting the next version of me. I love more self-discovery. I love expanding my being. I'm addicted to the expansion of me. You know, we're both baseball guys. And I remember making literally 1200 bucks a month. That made me who I am today.